All right, guys. So welcome back to the channel. Um, as always, I'm trying to bring special guests on the show. And today, we, you know, we've got somebody awesome with us, Mr. Mike Dillard. Some of you guys may or may not have heard of Mike Dillard, um, but you should if you haven't. He's an American entrepreneur um, who started several eight-figure businesses in revenue. Uh, he's done over $60 million in revenue in his career, at least at the time of me reading that and writing. Uh, you may have known him from the Self-Made Man podcast and several other things. But Mike, thank you for joining us, man. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, happy to be here, brother. Yeah, awesome. So you said uh, you're based in Austin, Texas, yeah? Yep. Very cool. And, and you grew up over there or? Um... Uh, I grew up in San Antonio. I've been in Austin about 12 years now. Okay. Yeah, it seems to be a place everyone's flocking to, man. Um, yeah. 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 Lot, lots of like in Austin, for sure, for sure. So, so I want to get my audience up to speed on some of the things you've done. Obviously, I mentioned sort of the high level on some of those things. Um, but maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, some of the specific businesses you've done. I know for me, I first heard about you. Um, I think I saw a Facebook ad from you talking about, um, uh, you know, some of the sales courses and things that you had on, mm -hmm. you know, how to sell online. And that was at least my first entry. And then I learned mm -hmm. about a whole range of stuff, whether, you know, the guests you had on your show. So maybe you can, you know, kind of give the audience an overview on that. Yeah, gosh, I got my start as an entrepreneur, probably uh, by the time I was 18 or 19, I knew that I wanted to work for myself. So all the way back to college, which was in like 1998, 99. Uh, it took me about five years to finally make my first dollar. So failed a lot, learned a lot, uh, found the skill of copywriting about five years into my journey and absolutely sucked at sales before that, obviously, which is why I didn't make any money. <laughs> worked so at PF Chang's, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I worked at PF Chang's for a while and a couple other corporate jobs while I was, you know, trying to support my entrepreneurial dreams and yeah, discovered direct response and copywriting and, and realized that you could write emails and website letters and uh, video scripts that would allow you to sell a product or service. And I wrote my first sales letter when I was probably 25, 26 years old. It sold an ebook that I wrote on attraction marketing. Mm -hmm. And gosh, within 90 days, I was selling $50,000 worth of that book. <clears throat> within another two years, $500,000 worth of that book and a few other courses I decided to write as I started to dive headfirst into internet marketing. Uh, started my second business in 2010 in the financial education space. That was post, you know, obviously the 2008 crash. And I wanted to learn how to invest like the wealthy did. So we built a business around that concept and learning different investment strategies that the rich use to, to get that way and then protect the wealth. <clears throat> that business did 3.2 million in revenue in our first seven days. We did eight figures in our first year. Very successful business. After that, I decided to develop the world's first automated hydroponic food production system called Evergrow. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd never developed a tech product before. That was a very, very uh, different path for me and a new challenge, which was incredibly fun, but very, very challenging and very expensive. So we got the prototype developed and working after about two years. And at that point, it had gone way over budget. It was going to take another two years and another two to $3 million in, in cash to bring it to market. So at that point, I decided to invest in a competitor of mine called Click and Grow, which you've probably seen ads for out there at some point. So I was able to invest in one of their early rounds. And uh, gosh, since then, built the self-made man education platform, which uh, we transition over to MikeDillard.com now and have really changed everything to pursue my personal brand at this point yeah. uh, instead of instead of the self-made man brand in general. So. Yeah. And obviously I checked out the new, you know, the new site you guys have and um, obviously, uh, you know, just at, at first glance, there's, you know, it seems like tremendous resources for entrepreneurs, whether they're in, you know, marketing or sales or a combination of both, mm -hmm. both internet and in-person stuff. Um, and, and the main focus of, of those courses now, yeah, are they sort of live courses people enroll for? Is it, you know, pre-made things that people are going through with intentions or? Yeah. I mean, by the time people see this, maybe uh, tomorrow we're launching Mike Dillard Mentoring, which is a year long mentoring program where every week we send out a video class that's either produced by myself or one of our instructors. And we've got just a phenomenal group of my peers and colleagues that donated their time to come in and fly down to Austin and produce just world-class educational content for, for fellow entrepreneurs. Um, guys like Andy Frazella, uh, Cameron Harold, uh, gosh, there's so many Christine Hassler, Lewis Howes, Drew Canoli. Yeah. So it's a pretty unique 
proposition. Not only will you learn from myself, but you'll also learn from a couple of other dozen people who've built eight and nine figure plus businesses. So that's my primary focus right now. And then uh, we'll be really diving into supporting large seven, eight, nine figure businesses with, uh, with marketing strategies and consulting here in the next year, which is kind of my bread and butter is, is working with companies that are already doing pretty substantial revenue, but they're not taking full advantage of the yeah. opportunities that are out there online wise. So do you find, um, and obviously, you know, every business is different, whether it's e-commerce or, you know, a big SaaS business, they have, you know, different needs, different marketing strategies, but do you still find that, um, you know, the email sequence, the email funnel is something that a lot of businesses are really neglecting as a, as a part of their business. Do you find that or? Yeah. Uh, you know, internet marketing is a little pond. It's like its own little world. And yeah. if you're involved in the internet marketing niche, then that's really all you're seeing. And this niche tends to go super deep down through the latest tactics, whether it's setting up a messenger bot or you know retargeting campaigns or things like that. But once you look around behind your back and away from the internet marketing niche and you look at real, you know, the real world, 95% of the businesses out there that are doing seven, eight, nine figures in revenue don't use 90% of the strategies that we use in our little microcosm here. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a really big opportunity right now that we're, we're turning our focus towards and it's really easy to make a giant impact with companies who are already doing a hundred million dollars in revenue and don't know what a retargeting pixel is. So. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's so fractal. Yeah. And even, even the biggest businesses are neglecting, like you said, simple things like that, which is interesting nonetheless. So yeah, anybody will, um, you know, who's interested, whether you're an entrepreneur now or looking to, you know, like Mike said, go after your dreams in, in one of your entrepreneurial endeavors. I think that's a good resource for people to check out. So I'll link that below MikeDiller.com for anybody who wants to check that out. Um, but Mike, so one of the things obviously that I, and we could probably talk at length um, about everything business related, but one of the things I started to see you post more and more on on Twitter about was things blockchain related. Um, obviously here on the channel, you know, in my daily life, that's what I'm doing every single day. Um, you know, I founded a project called Karma. I think you're somewhat familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, making videos to try to, try to, you know, bring complicated topics simple to people who are watching it here on the channel. So what's, uh, you know, maybe it's too vague of a question, but sort of what are your thoughts right now on, you know, obviously it seems positive from, you know, bullish uh, over the long haul from the things you tweet about, but I'm curious as your thoughts on, on the market. Uh, yeah. I mean, I bought my first Bitcoin in early 2013, February, March of 2013, when it was about 70 bucks. So I've been in this space for a while now and, you know, bought Ethereum when I think it was like $5. Um, so gosh, it's, it's really interesting. It's a different industry post 2017. Uh, with yeah. the regulations that have come into place with the, the, the die down of the ICO markets and things like that. And I think it, right now it's in a transition. It's in a very big transition phase uh, that's causing a lot of trouble for a lot of people, but it's going to ultimately set the foundation for the industry to mature yeah. uh, and to move on. So I think 2017 was our version of the dot-com bubble. Um, and now I think the real projects out there are going to to start to find footing, form, uh, you know, proper government regulation and and uh, security and all of those good things. But uh, ultimately, I'm bullish on the market right now. I'm specifically bullish on Bitcoin, um, and I'm waiting to see what happens here with the next cycle. I've been averaging in every month, you know, buying buying in at three thousand, telling my audience to buy in at three thousand when we hit thirty one hundred. Um, and now it's just a waiting game and that's fine. Um, I'm used to, I've made a lot of investments and, uh, the, the most important thing is to get the trend right, which I think we all have in this industry. Now it's just having the patience to wait for the time yeah. to catch up. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's so many things you touched on, but I think one thing for people watching, uh, that's really important is, you know, somebody watching, right? Someone like Mike um, could obviously go out and probably snag a decent amount of Bitcoin at whether it's this price or a different price. But someone like Mike is having the discipline for anybody watching to still dollar cost average, right? Like you said, you've got it set monthly. So it sort of takes the thought out of it. And, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think the reason why you do that, um, for anybody who doesn't understand dollar cost averaging is you don't know when this is going to happen. Um, and it's just trying to take, I think, like you said, the stress out of the situation, 
be systemized with what you're doing and nobody has a crystal ball. Um, as to no, nobody knows what is going to happen to Bitcoin. And that's what I tell, you know, my students uh, when it comes to this industry. I'm like, hey, this is Vegas money. This is the money you would take to Vegas and blow at a blackjack table and don't put more money into it. Uh, than you can afford to lose because this is either going to continue to be the best investment in history, which Bitcoin is, uh, or it's going to go to zero. And we just don't know. Uh, no. I think that obviously I'm betting on the first, the first option. <laughs> yeah. um, but at the same time, you know, I'm not going into debt. I'm not buying it with credit cards. Uh, it's, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going down it into that deep of a rabbit hole. So Yep. That's it. I think it's more important to own some Bitcoin than zero Bitcoin today. And, you know, it's just a matter of patience at, at that point. So, yeah. And I think we're, you know, even on a, on, on a global, like kind of sort of macro level, I think we're seeing, you know, even just rumors, hints, breadcrumbs of big countries wanting to see, you know, moving some of their reserves into it to some extent. And obviously that's yet to happen in like an announced way. Um, but it seems again, if that trend continues, it, it seems that that may be a, an advantage for some countries to try to at least, you know, take that risk and make that more, you know, a part of, you know, their monetary systems. But nonetheless, the monetary systems are a deeper, much deeper issue. <laughs> globally. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the interesting part of it is, you know, especially if it, if it does continue to gain footing in other countries, how will the U.S. government's policies specifically change uh, because it will become a competitor to the U.S. dollar? The good news around that is it's, continuing to work its way into the u.s financial uh infrastructure you know in wall street so the the further that moves along the harder it will be to to peel it off uh so there's still a lot of question marks up in the air it's unbelievably speculative and it's uh, yeah. a very asymmetric risk reward you know venture right now which is great uh but you have to you have to have the discipline to know that that is absolutely the case and that you could lose all of your money and as long as you're uh, approaching the market with that understanding and doing it in a disciplined way, then awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how familiar are you, Mike, with, um, with some of the DPoS projects, right? Things like Steam or EOS. Um, I mean, more specifically EOS, I'd say, obviously, in, in, in current time. Yeah, I mean, I bought, I bought some EOS, uh, I think, when it was like 50 cents. I didn't buy enough, <laughs> obviously. Uh, 50 cents or 5 cents, I don't remember. Anyway. I think 50 because there was the like the Dutch auction rounds going. I think at 50 was around, you know, one of the lowest. Yeah, you could that's, snag that's, it that's what I think it was too. And so look with all of these projects right now, any of them, it's pure speculation. And for sure, there is very much an aspect of this that's been talked about for years now of using crypto to try and solve a problem that doesn't necessarily exist at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and the at the end of the day most applications don't need a decentralized database yeah. uh you know eos is running into issues right now around uh you know the the voting system that's in place and uh who holds all the power and it's just there's a lot still being figured out and i think it's trying to be it's, i think it's trying to be applied to applications and opportunities and ideas that it's not necessarily you know the best option for i think it, you know just a regular standard server with standard security might be just fine um the the big primary exception around that i see uh, is money obviously bitcoin has a very successful and proven use case around money yeah. uh, i see a lot of big opportunities around digital objects of value so digital objects that cannot be counterfeited yeah. i see a lot of opportunity for increased efficiency when it comes to handling contracts and titles and uh, uh, securities and, and distributing earnings and things like that. Yeah. But those are, those are all many, many years away, I think, from getting any kind of real traction. I'm always a fan of looking towards the gaming industry yeah. uh, to, to be one of the first industries that will successfully apply new ideas and new tech. So I've invested in some of the, uh, the gaming uh, projects out there like, uh, like Wax. Um, yeah. And then secure communications. So I think any decentralized secure communications app out there has some opportunity as well. Um, and the real miracle around Bitcoin that allowed it to become what it has become is the fact that 
there there are no known developers, right? There's Satoshi. There is no that's who created Bitcoin Bitcoin who can go be arrested or you know, whatever it may be. And so when you look at all of these other decentralized applications with teams, with offices that are compliant, that have registered with the government, it's just, is it really decentralized at that point? Like if someone can raid the EOS office and arrest Larimer, Brock or whomever, The the Brock one office, yeah. It's not really decentralized, you know, like, so yeah, all the, of this the only, still needs the to only counter. Out. Yeah, no, I feel you. The only counter I'd say on, on that, just that last point um, yeah. with, with EOS list specifically um, sort of the key system, right? So there's a, there's a newer project on EOS and what they just did, they, they locked the contract, right? The key, they swapped the keys in a way that nobody, you know, nobody had access to them and the contracts untouchable um, mm-hmm. from being changed. And, and I think, um, you know, it, again, like you said, some of these governance things are still playing out. And when we have, you know, a lot of the BPs in, you know, particular parts of the world or other parts of the world, of course, one of the thoughts is, you know, what happens if, you know, a particular government comes down um, and, you know, forces the hand in one way or the other of the, of the block producers. But I think, I think those are, you know, that's a risk nonetheless um, that exists for sure. But I think within these like in individual projects, you know, just sort of setting up proper multi-sigs or even like we said, locking contracts, um, can make these things, you know, sort of, could they still cause problems for a founder? Totally. Um, and still put somebody in jail and make it a real hard time for sure. But actually, and that may have kept, you know, resulting effects as, you know, as a result to that as well. But I think uh, that that ability exists to, to sort of help curb that, I think, in a way that, um, you know, makes it closer maybe to this, <laughs> to this Satoshi model, you know, this yeah. founders being yeah. known. Yeah. So, uh, you know, at this point in the industry, I'm, I'm just checked out. And I'm, I'm casually keeping up with it. Uh, I'm waiting f- to see if the alt cycle is going to start up again and to, to really pick up some alts at the bottom, which may be right now, uh, may not be. But for me, that it's a purely speculative play. And I'm playing, I'm playing human greed more so than the tech yeah. uh, from a long-term perspective. And yeah, that's it. I, you know, I, I deal in human psychology and and yeah. watching and participating in the last two bubbles was a fascinating experience. And I'm hoping for a third, <laughs> obviously. Um, but Absolutely. I'm not outside of Bitcoin investing in the tech itself at this point. It's just human greed and speculation. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think all, all solid points for sure. So I think, uh, yeah, I'd be keen to see how, the, how this thing shakes out. So mm-hmm. I'll, I'll keep in mind if, you know, if you're tweeting things about it and seeing what your thoughts are. Yeah. Um, so w- one of the things I wanted to move on to, um, you know, if, uh, if, if you want to chat about it is digital privacy and sort of, and obviously that word, you know, the phrase is sort of vague, but I, I, what I more specifically mean is just sort of what some of these, you know, the larger scale tech companies are doing um, through things like Project Veritas, some of these other projects that have put out, you know, really what seems like hardcore, you know, info on things Facebook has done, things Google's doing to sort of pick and choose winners and affect what people are seeing and what they're not seeing and sort of how you think that may affect things like elections coming up or, you know, organic growth. Do you, do you have any thoughts on, on that? I know it's sort of a big question. But. Yeah, well, no, I mean, it's an interesting one because the governments who make the rules and carry the guns for the most part do not want privacy. Uh, They want to fight encryption and they want backdoors built into everything. Uh, I think that is one application that crypto does bring to the table from a a decentralized perspective that can really help with that. Uh, Again, going back to uh, secure chat apps and things like that. Uh, What's really interesting to me is the opportunity around let's just say a project or concept similar to civic in helping secure our identities and communications the scariest thing that i see right now that could literally end the world are it's really how how far the the deep fake technology has progressed when it comes to mimicking people's faces voices whatever where you can literally make president trump say whatever you want Yeah. And it would take an absolute expert to go in and forensically, you know, know the difference between a real render and one that's been modified that the public is not going to believe or care about. They're going to see Trump saying something absolutely horrific or doing something absolutely horrific. And it's going to be completely fake and staged through this tech. And at that point, by the news time, the news is spread. It's over. 
So a friend of mine, Evan Pagan, when we were talking about crypto two or three years ago, you know, he's like, at some point, I believe that every single human is going to have their own blockchain that is built into their phone, their computer, every part of their lives, and every single thing that they do is going to be put onto that blockchain in real time in the background and stored there uh, for reference with your identity stamp and whatever so that, hey, you did make that video, you took that picture, you sent that email. Like In a, in a world where anything can be hacked or faked, yeah. there's going to need a way for all of us to protect who we are and what we say and what we do. So that to me is a really interesting concept, obviously that will take a long time to develop, but um, yeah, security and privacy is gonna be a huge, huge, huge battle in the, coming, in the coming years. And I think crypto is the counter uh, to the, you know, the, the way it's been going so far, which is yeah. the removal of all of our privacy and security, so. Yeah, no, super, super interesting concept you brought up and I'm glad you did. Um, which is the, the, you know, the deep fake aspect. That's something for me that, you know, is both exciting, fun to watch and, and terrifying um, at the same time, because like you said, when people see, uh, you know, whatever the particular video is with, you know, X person saying something horrific, they've got no motivation to go see if that's true. They just well, see what they saw, or at least yeah. the average person, they're going to see it and feel that. And then it's, it, you're trying to, you're trying to walk it back from, you know, seeing what you thought was real. And well, you could take a third party terrorist state right who comes up with uh, a video of putin declaring war in the united states and launching a nuke and then they've also got one with the united states and trump having to respond and they could create this whole interactive story that they just release into the world that yeah is a fantasy event that will then trigger real world events and by the time anyone's exactly. figuring out what's going on it's too late right so yeah. that's the that's the scary piece yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, I, and I agree with you. I think, I think blockchain or aspects of it um, are, are really a, a, a counter, <laughs> you know, our counter weapon to some of these things. Um, and what you mentioned about everybody individually having their own blockchain, that's something I've thought about. And, and I think your, uh, your friend, you said it was Evan Pagan who said that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really interesting concept for sure. And um, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? In a lot of ways, I mean, we're all using these platforms and people like, um, you know, whatever is Instagram, Twitter, some of these different things, because you have your timeline, right? Your hopefully unchanged history that's, you know, ever looking back on all the things you did and you go, oh, it's 2013. Let's look at these photos we did. And you, and you sort of have your own, it's not, it's not a blockchain at this point, obviously, right? Those are stored on centralized databases. But, um, you know, when that, when that tech's fully ready and all these chains can interconnect without the friction that, that exists currently, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and it hopefully will be, uh, it still needs to be human readable, right? Uh, to be able to navigate those things, which some, most chains aren't at this point, but some are getting closer to. Um, yeah. But I think that, that actually makes a lot of sense for how this thing will, will shape out. And that way somebody can go, nope, look at my chain. Look, I, and everything's timestamped. You have total proof over what it was. Um, and only your, you know, you have the ability to get in there. But then it, even, I still have concerns, man, about the, you know, the key aspect, right? I mean, for so many people, private key is, you know, intimidating to some extent too yeah i know it's it's uh it, it's still way too techy and bio uh, but biometrics have their setbacks as well too you know um yeah yeah someone holds no, your, holds your thumb up yeah your face the camera while you're sleeping <laughs> yeah no the you know the, the we have an opportunity because we have to deal with things like public and private keys right now which are too complicated for the the average person yeah and so that still means we're very much in the early, early adopter phase uh, the moment blockchain is integrated into all of your banking and communication apps and you don't even see it anymore, mm -hmm. th that's when the opportunity is already over. So um, yeah. I see that as a, as a good sign right now as far as timing uh, is concerned. Yeah. Do you think any of these projects, and, and obviously not wanting to speak on speculation, any specific projects, but some of these, some of these projects that are aiming, they're higher market cap coins that are aiming to sort of be the intermediary for banks, um, you know, and how they're moving money around. I, I, <laughs> I think, I, yeah, some of these projects, I, I just think, I, I think it's been great marketing that's been done on people. But again, like unless the, you know, these outside businessmen can come in and make such an, you know, such a, you know, an appealing case for existing <laughs> people in power structures to come on and get a piece of their thing, they're going to go, well, we're going to look at your tech, take what, what's relevant and make our own thing. Why would we? Yes. Yes. And why, and why, why do we need to be buy XRP coins and, and use that when we can just make our own internal 
banking blockchain that we have full control over or whatever, and it increases security and we keep control over it. That's what the banks want. Yeah. You know, they don't want a, a fully decentralized thing. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely not a fan of XRP and it's, but at the same time, I made a lot of money on it during the, during the speculative, <laughs> you know, waves that yeah. uh, it has had. And if it has another one, I'll make some more money on it, but I'm definitely not voting on, on that project specifically uh, for any kind of long-term potential. So y y your thoughts are that it's not going to be the, the foundational way we'll move money in the future. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I think, have to my, agree. Yeah. yeah, again, my, my vote is on Bitcoin and the further development of Bitcoin with lightning and things like that, uh, that will increase its capacity there. It has the momentum. It has the user base, it has the momentum, it has the developer teams uh, behind it and nothing else other than Ethereum even comes close, you know, Ethereum and then EOS. And that's, you know, maybe Tron has some, some dApps being, you know, developed yeah. right now, but again, none of them are being used other than Bitcoin, like with, with, uh, and Ethereum. Hmm. So when I see an application on any of those that have a couple million users on a daily basis, okay, now you've got my attention. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen that happen. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think there's, you know, there's definitely projects that, I, that I'm, you know, that I have in mind that I think have potential to do that. But like you said, until that happens, right, where it's just a, we're watching to see what happens. And you can't, you know, pick and guess winners when things are in such a, such a low fare. I mean, it's, it's a losing battle. You're kind of throwing darts at a, you know, at a, at a, at a big wall. <laughs> Take Telegram, right? So first. Yeah, so I will, let's talk about Telegram, right? Like they're the first massive company with tens of millions of users that are going to deploy a blockchain token to their infrastructure somehow. I don't know what the function is going to be or how it's going to work or why it's needed. Yeah. Uh, but they could, they could integrate a blockchain to their app and get the benefits of it. Why does there need to be a token? Like why does there, why does it need to be traded and why does it need to go up and down in value? And you know, I just, there's whole, there's, there's pieces of this business uh, in this industry that still don't make sense to me yet. Um, yeah, I think something like with Telegram, uh, I mean, the only thing I can say, right, I mean, obviously, you know, your view, I think, is the view of, uh, you know, as the view I share, but and I think is a view of a lot of, let's say, just like, you know, shakers and movers of how Bitcoin is viewed as sort of, you know, where in a sense money's going, or at least, the you know, how it could be back in the future. But I think, obviously, for me, what, you know, what attracts people to cryptocurrencies generally, apart from the greed speculation, which is a huge point, um, is obviously just the, the transparency and accountability on these things, knowing how many exist, knowing how many will exist and, and having those rules be mathematically proven yep. and predictable. Um, and I think obviously companies like Telegram, of course, you know, when their token comes out and that's, an, and that's a part of it, I think it's gotta be one of those things, especially with these chat apps and I'm, and I'm working with one right now that's in the EOS space. I think they've got to make it as easy to come on as possible. Come on. You don't even need an account a crypt, uh, or a blockchain wallet or any sort of on-chain account. Come on and do your messaging. Oh, by the way, you can do these things with the tokens. It's here if you want it. But that's, I think, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm expecting to see from yeah. them. I'm expecting it to be built into the app natively and you don't even know what's going on. But then I want to yeah. know what is the point of having the token? Uh, and is it going to be a, a decentralized piece where people are going to be, you know, helping to secure the network and mining through their cell phone in a, in a, a passive way in the background. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. And that's, that's one of the interesting ones on how much, how much money they raise and how little anybody knows about what they're planning to do. But I, I but telegram is, is growing. I mean, especially since, you know what I mean? A lot of the, some of the things we mentioned on earlier with people getting shadow banned or people getting removed, a lot of those people are flocking over to Telegram as well as the existing, you know, nine figure plus user base that they had. And I think it's, you know, it's because they're not trying to, you know, censor what people are doing and allowing free communication, but everything, everything comes with a, uh, every action has a reaction, right? The, you know, yeah. it's not all, it's not all flowers and rainbows. Yeah. Um, Awesome. So, uh, I think, you know, we covered a tremendous amount of stuff, Mike. Um, I would love to have you back on the channel. Um, mm -hmm. I want to you know, obviously respect your time. You're a busy guy. You got a lot going on. Um, but like I said, for anybody watching this, um, if you found this informative, please go follow Mike on Twitter. Um, you know, he's always sharing cool stuff and go to, go to Mike Um, so yeah, go check that out. There's an amazing, um, you know, plethora of resources on there as well as Mike's YouTube channel. He's got great content that, uh, that used to be behind a paywall and stuff. A lot of it's on there now. And I'm fortunate to, to be able to check out some of that stuff that he's got on there. So check out that if you guys have an interest. I hope everybody enjoyed the conversation. And Mike, thank you so much. I really- Yeah, Dallas. Uh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks, uh, thanks for listening and watching, guys.